All right, well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, the presentation probably will not last a full hour, so we'll get you out of here on time. Uh, I am going to use this microphone. It might look a little odd, and the speakers are, are mic'd up as well. That's for the benefit of the video. Um, it's not actually going to be amplified into the room. But my name is John Servos. I am the uh, Commercialization Education Coordinator for Fast Forward Medical Innovation. For those of you unfamiliar with Fast Forward Medical Innovation, or FFMI, and we strive to be the front door to biomedical innovation here at the university. And we kind of have a three-prong attack at doing that. We have mentorship and funding, <coughs> excuse me, through our Amtrak and Kickstart program. We have a business development team that uh, manages relationships between industry and existing research happening here on campus. And then we have the commercialization education arm, which leads us here tonight. So as, as part of our education portfolio, we have a lot of different offerings. Tonight happens to be one of our uh, CME accredited uh, events. So if you are in need of that CME credit, there are further instructions in the folder on how to claim that post-program. And then in addition to that, I'll be sending out uh, an evaluation by email. And if you could just take a few minutes to complete that. Um, at the back end of that email, there's also an opportunity to give us some feedback on some upcoming educational offerings or speakers that you would like to hear about. So on to uh, non-disclosure agreements. Uh, we feel very fortunate to have these two gentlemen joining us here today. Uh, we owe them a lot of thanks. Uh, uh, Ed Pagani from the Office of Tech Transfer and Tony Nielsen are generous enough to join us. Um, and then Amanda Coulter also had uh, a key role into putting this presentation together, so I'd like to thank her publicly as well. So without further delay and without hearing from me any further, I'll turn it over to uh, Ed and Tony. Thank you. Great. All right, thanks a lot. Um, just uh, introduction, you know, he obviously introduced us, but um, it might work better if we just keep this formal. If you've got questions, ask them. Uh, doesn't hurt at all and won't interrupt our flow. It's the first time doing this, so um, it, it'll be fine. So. Mm -hmm. And um, Tony and I are, haven't choreographed our presentation, so, but we're going to work, work, both work off the slides and uh, talk to you about the secrets of non-disclosure agreements. So I'm, I assume everyone signed a non-disclosure agreement so that we can tell you those secrets, right? So, <laughs> if not, we're going to have to hold them back. So. All right. What is a non-disclosure agreement? Uh, it's a contract. Um, provides for the treatment of you know, confidential information. Um, you know, you could all read the slides, but I think for the purposes of sort of uh, our internal administration and how we process these things, something interesting about this is something that should be so simple. An NDA to the University of Michigan is sort of a term of art, and um, we're generally talking about things where we're going to have discussions, uh, we're going to talk about potential research, we're going to talk about potential licensing, things like that. Um, and we'll get to another slide, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, but um, understanding what it is will help you when you see, get a contract in your hand that the sponsor has given you. It'll say all sorts of things on the top. And just keep in mind that doesn't necessarily mean it is or is not an NDA. So as long as you understand that concept, then knowing what the purpose is of the transaction, what you'll be discussing or what you'll be doing will help you sort it all out. So just that's a guideline, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. So, so it's about keeping secrets, right? Um, usually, well, in my office, usually we're keeping the sponsor secrets. Um, it, in OTT, it's a different purpose. Um, for the most part, we're protecting University of Michigan confidential information that may uh, find its way into a a patent uh, application. And under patent law, um, there, are, uh, there are guidelines and rules uh, that strictly um, determine when, when information, if disclosed, uh, is not, um, not patentable. And it's for different, you know, the United States uh, has different um, uh, rulings uh, compared to other jurisdictions around the world. So it's very important that the information um, disclosed to OTT is, um, is protected before any public disclosure. But even, even if it isn't in a patent application and unpatentable, it's still important at times to protect it. Software, we often don't patent. But it's, it still could be very important from a commercial perspective you know, to protect that information. And that could be done you know, by using a, a non-disclosure agreement. So what's important to the central <clears throat> offices is knowing what the secret is. So 
you know, if we're going to be exchanging something, if they're going to be giving us something, um, you know, Michigan FOIA law requires that we have some non-confidential description of what it is, just so that if somebody makes a FOIA request, we'll know that this is actually confidential, and then you know we won't release it because it'll be exempt theoretically. So. A lot of times we'll get these agreements and there won't be a real clear description. And if you look at the agreement itself, that's not super helpful most of the time because it'll be a sort of kitchen sink sort of, you know, everything is confidential. We'll edit those as central offices. Yeah? Just double check, does everybody know what a FOIA request is? So the question is, is does everybody know what a FOIA request is? Um, most people are familiar with the Freedom of Information Act as a concept. Um, most states have varying versions of this, including Michigan. We are a public entity, which means most of our documents that we create, generate, and process are public documents. There are some exceptions, and I won't get into the, the peculiarities of the law because Michigan's is actually a little bit different than a lot of states, but essentially most of the transactions we deal with are public. This is one of the exceptions. This is about keeping secrets, and if we do it right, we'll be able to do that and these won't be considered public documents, which is key to our functioning. Mm -hmm. So there's one thing I'd like to point out. It talks about uh, this, this about signing prior to exchanging information. If you're ever in a situation in which confidential information was, ex was exchanged between, between the parties, there is a chance under cir certain circumstances to, to backdate the, um, the NDA to capture that information. The risk there is that the parties don't know uh, that the information needs to be kept confidential. So during the time that it isn't protected, you have no recourse. Uh, the only other time we wouldn't do it is if it, if it uh, involved any aspects of patent law. You know, we couldn't um, represent to the, the um, USPTO you know, that information wasn't disclosed if it was indeed disclosed under non-confidential uh, discussions. But for many other instances, it can be, can be managed. Yes, to Ed's point, sometimes we can save you if they've already had this exchange and by backdating the contract, and sometimes you can't, so there's risk there. Yes? I would like to understand whether NDA needs to be signed before you apply for a patent, uh, after you apply for a patent, also you can discuss with someone that time you can sign it. Well, yeah. well, the, well <laughs> this, um, we could spend a lot of time discussing that point, but in a disclosure for, for it to be a, a considered a public disclosure, there are criteria. I mean, one, it needs to, the information needs to be enabling so that the information is disclosed, whoever is taking it would be able to take that and reduce it to practice. So if the information isn't enabling, um, it still may be considered sensitive, but it wouldn't prevent one from filing a, a patent application. Um, that's, one, that's one part of it. Um, the other is to whom you're disclosing it to. If it's someone who's very familiar with the area, it could be considered a disclosure and a CDA would need to be in place. But if I was um, taking information from a, um, let's say a nuclear physicist about a, a nuclear reactor, I'm not an expert in that area. So the information that I'm receiving wouldn't mean much to me if it was highly technical. So that, that also may not be considered a, a public disclosure. But it's best to have these things signed if, if it's patentable material, potentially patent material, before any information is disclosed. And if you're not sure, call OTT. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that should be one of the takeaways, actually. If you, if, if you have <clears throat> something that you consider to be confidential that you would like to disclose to a sponsor, call OTT just to see if they want to do a, a disclosure on it. Um, it's, it's a real simple process. You just give them a call. They'll say yes or no, and it, you know. But it, but you really want to do that first, so you know what you're dealing with, and you know whether or not that NDA needs to be in place. So uh, you know, again, that bottom point I sort of already made. It's you know they're called CDAs, PIAs, NDAs. There are tons of different ways you could describe it, but again, it all of them are or are not necessarily what we're calling an NDA for our purposes. So understanding the transaction is the key. So here are some examples um, that uh, the information that may be considered confidential. So data, chemical structures, or just an idea and that you want to be protected. And um, for, pu for publications uh, or not, if the information is meant for a journal, student dissertation, patent application, there, there are different 
um, degrees, if you will, um, that, you're, you're, that this information needs to be um, kept confidential. Um, the other one point here about unpublished patent applications. That's a provisional patent application. It's filed. The information is not disclosed to the public um, for up to a year until it's converted to a non-provisional. And even a non-provisional um, pending patent application is not published for a few months. So during that time, the information isn't available to the public. And if you want to exchange that information with someone, you may consider uh, signing a, um, an NDA to protect the information. So, but of course, once it's in the public domain, then the information is no longer confidential and the NDA doesn't govern the um, treatment of that, of that information. Um, software code algorithms, um, you know, that's something that we wouldn't necessarily patent, but it's confidential, you'd want to protect that. And there are other types of things like customer lists, manufacturing process, price lists that a vendor or an um, in industrial partner may consider to be confidential to their, to their business. So it may not be scientific information. It could be uh, things outside of um, customer lists and similar material. So you could have a separate agreement. <clears throat> That's a standalone agreement designed for you know, these sort of transactions where we're having discussions, et cetera. But especially when you're working with industry, you will have the essence of those agreements in every single other agreement, whether it be you know, funded agreement or unfunded collaboration or material transfer there will be the same terms in all these agreements. So once you understand it in general, you'll understand exactly how it works in all of these. Usually what happens is, is the initial NDA you sign will be for the early discussions. But because almost every single agreement has its own terms, <coughs> usually what happens is, is the terms of the agreement, the funding agreement or whatever the subsequent agreement is, controls. Sometimes they're the same, Sometimes they're not, and again, it's a good lesson and read the contracts. So when do you need an NDA? It's not always an easy question, but um, again, the, the, the most common scenario is, is you're gonna talk to a sponsor, they're gonna have to give you confidential information or you're gonna have to give them confidential information for discussions about potential research projects or potential licensing deals. That is the most common scenario. Um, when will you need something else? And again, this goes back to regardless of what it says on the top, NDA, CDA, PIA. If you're doing something else, you, even though you, we may start and use that same agreement for internal processing and administrative purposes, it's a different transaction than an NDA, because again, we've established that as a term of art. So if we're receiving you know, a data set, software, money, all these indicates that a standard NDA from our perspective may not be appropriate. You know, same if you're actually conducting research, if you're doing testing, if you're doing consulting. All these things really, it's a different sort of agreement, at least the way the university perceives it, because there are some other terms that are not typically in an NDA that we will want to be in here. Once we understand that that's the nature of the transaction, we'll be able to do that. But without knowing that, uh, it's a lot harder. And of course, if you're doing something outside of your role as a U of M employee, the transactions don't go through our offices. Um, you can consult your own counsel, which is what we always recommend. Um, and again, make sure that you're reporting it to whatever you know, conflict of interest committees require it. But other than that, that's not something that we'll handle. So is an NDA always, always required? And I think uh, you know, Tony mentioned on this, it's not always. Um, it's best to call OTT or, or uh, ORSP and uh, talk about what, you, what your intentions are in exchanging this information. But if, if the information is already in the public domain, you don't need an NDA. If, um, if there's no need to protect the information, even if it isn't in the public domain, um, don't, don't sign an NDA. Often, you know, when you're talking to third parties, the first thing they want to do is sign an NDA. Um, I wouldn't advise to do that. You really will understand what the nature of the, of the discussion is. Um, is it really important to sign the NDA? Because with that comes obligations. Um, there's, um, 
You need to keep data in files for years um, under the NDA. That could be three or five years. So it's, added, it's an added burden to yourself and to the university to take this information. And um, it's, uh, it's not, not advisable. So understand what you're, what you're getting into before you ask to put an NDA in place. So that's a great point. And um, it's, there is a sort of unfortunate side with working with a lot of industry sponsors because uh, some, um, especially some of the smaller ones, ironically, consider everything they own, touch, et cetera, as con their confidential information. And sometimes they won't even have any discussions without an NDA. So understanding when that scenario is there and they're insisting upon it, of course, we'll do it. But Ed's got an excellent point. You know, you can oftentimes have a great deal of discussion without actually getting to that level. So, yes. so just choose wisely. Okay. Question? In the absence of an NDA, does marking something confidential not for distribution protect me in any way? So the question is, in the absence of an NDA, marking it confidential, is there um, protection? The answer is no. And the reason is, is that the parties uh, don't understand the, um, the treatment of that information and um, under uh, what, what, what are exceptions you know, for, for releasing that information. All that is um, discussed in an NDA. There's also a remedy. You know, if the contract is breached uh, in any way, what's, what's the remedy to the party that's damaged? And so many NDAs, NDAs contain information. So you can't rely on uh, stamping it. In fact, um, at times, um, you know, we receive information stamped confidential from a third party in the absence of an NDA. And I usually um, will not look at it in detail. I'll just notice it's stamped. I'll call them up and let them know that we do not have a non-disclosure agreement in place. So I'm, I'm not going to read this information. If you want me to read it, either unmark it or um, let's sign an NDA if it's necessary. Yeah, there's, there's uh, this very in-depth legal answer that goes into when you can form a contract, but something we're gonna to get to is there's a good chance that unless any of you know specifically to the contrary, none of you can sign an agreement on behalf of U of M. That being the case, somebody giving you uh, something labeled confidential, you can't even argue that there was, you know, <laughs> there was an oral agreement because you're, you're not able to bind U of M. So that's exactly to Ed's point. So, yeah, when do you need one? Um, again, this goes to when you really have confidential information to exchange, either you personally, U of M, or the sponsor. Um, you know, you get to the point of discussions where really now you need to know some chemical formula or some sort of, you know, proprietary piece of data before you can actually determine if you want to work with this company, if you're able to do what you think you want to do, et cetera. And that's the point at which it's most appropriate. Again, you know, we, we have some flexibility, so. Yeah, there are some, some companies, their entire um, commercial activity is based on trade secret and confidential information. So it's the only way uh, to, protect, um, to protect the company. It's not a, it's not a good position to be in, but um, if, if it's not patentable um, because uh, they choose not to patent it, um, or if it's unpatentable material based on prior art but it's still valuable to the business, they'll require uh, an NDA. I mean, one, one that's an um, uh, example of confidential information for a business is the recipe to Coca-Cola. It is not, uh, it is not uh, patented, but the recipe is, um, is secret. So they, they've done a pretty good, made a pretty good business out of that recipe by just keeping it, keeping it confidential. And, and of course, one of the advantages of doing something like that, even if you could patent it, is that yeah. the protection lasts forever as long as you follow all the rules of trade secrets. So that's why some of these companies are very serious about the obligations of these agreements. Because especially if it's only a trade secret and it's something that's not patentable, that's their bread and butter. That's, that's their existence. And so if you, if you were to you know, release that somehow, that's, that's, that's a real bad news for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously you guys didn't go into law. So, but what's sometimes useful is just understanding the different sections so you can know at a glance what, what you can pay you know, more attention to and what you don't need to pay attention to. You know, some of the sections about the obligations, you know, do you have to return it? Can they request that you return or destroy it? Uh, that's something pretty common in these and you'll definitely want to know um, 
you know, the ownership should be obvious, and most of the time it is. You know, if they're giving it to us, they own it. We give it to them, we own it. Um, you know, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time in our offices arguing about oral disclosures, but, you know, generally what Michigan law requires is that you, in advance, tell them that it's going to be confidential, give it to them, and follow it up in writing, uh, you know, within 20 business days. Uh, the term is how long we have to treat this confidential. Um, generally speaking, uh, we want some limited time period. Um, it's supposed to be reasonable in relation to the nature of the material, which when sponsors are giving us their confidential information, we have to take the word on it because we don't really know. Um, the miscellaneous legal provisions is where we spend an awful lot of our life. So the question was, is if it's a trade secret, the time period is immaterial, what do you do? That's an excellent question. And trade secret law still applies. So there are times when the sponsor requires that the <coughs> confidential period be indefinite for that very reason. And we can accommodate that. Michigan law can accommodate that. So that's something that we do. Yeah. I don't think there would be any instances that the university has trade secrets. That's, would you agree, Tony? I mean, as opposed to confidential information? That's a good question. You know what, I used to think that there wasn't any, but I mm -hmm. think U of M does have some, uh, particularly with stuff um, you know, that we can't patent. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, well, that, I don't, you would, could yeah. patent that theoretically, yeah. but maybe an example would be a proprietary database. So let's say you've been doing research, you've been collecting data, right? The data itself is not HIPAA data. Uh, there's no rules related to that. And theoretically, all that data is publicly available because it had been published over time, but you've been aggregating it into a database. And that database is very valuable, but it's not patentable. It's really not copyrightable for any practical purposes. But we want to keep it confidential in many instances. So that might be yeah. uh, one of U of M's few trade secrets. But it, it's, it's probably, it's a, it's, it's a, it, a great exception even if it does exist. It is, it is. Yeah, it may not even, we may not even have any. It's, it's, but it's something that we need in this room not worry about. It's it, basically but confidential. Quiet, we have to know, right? Like in case we are working with a company or something. Yes. Well, it, you won't be able to sign it. Yeah, you no, won't. <laughs> yeah. Will it agree for it? That's what I mean. Yes, U of M can agree to it if, if that's the scenario. And, and yes, you'll want to tell the central offices mm -hmm. because we'll want to evaluate that. Yeah. So, um, this, we, we've tried to um, demystify one, one aspect of, of, a, of, of the terminology of, you'll hear a one-way NDA and a two-way NDA. So there are two types of one-way uh, non-disclosure agreements. Um, same document, but it's, it, it, it differentiates between the receiving party and the, um, the party that's uh, revealing the confidential information. So a one-way outgoing NDA would be if someone at the University of Michigan or a company was exchanging their information to, to a recipient. So that would be one way going out from the company or one way going out from the University of Michigan. Um, a two way, uh, both parties are, are exchanging confidential information. So that's important to know um, because often um, you know, you'll request a one way uh, NDA or a company will request a one, and one way NDA. We need to determine uh, is, uh, what party is uh, disclosing and what, what, which of the parties are, uh, is receiving uh, the, the, the information. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point, especially when you're dealing with one of our offices, knowing that, yes, in fact, we are both disclosing and receiving. And, and the reason this is sort of important, and knowing when we're not, because, so, for example, uh, my office, ORSP, will handle in, you know, incoming sponsor confidential information. But a lot of times, a sponsor will want to give us a two-way NDA. So when we receive that, we say, oh, well, what are we disclosing? But if you let us know, like when you process, you know, go through the UFA system or process this, you know, say it's a two-way NDA, but we're not disclosing anything. That's all we need to know. And then we'll just process it like that. Mm -hmm. And in the, sometimes the sponsors are just trying to be helpful and in a way that doesn't necessarily help us, so.
Of course, yeah, Ed already covered this two-way. You've got disclosures going both ways. So um, the notes we have down here, um, you know, so if you think you have confidential information, go to OTT, see if you want to make a disclosure. If not, again, just let us know because if, if we're disclosing something that's really not something that U of M considers confidential, not something that we would do a disclosure on, ORSP will still handle the NDA. Uh, but just let us know that. Say, you know, it's a two-way, we're going to be disclosing, talk to o, uh, you know, OTT, and they don't want to make a disclosure at this point. This is great information for us in how we review these and negotiate these. So that's uh, really good information. And it also helps our offices figure out who handles these. And it's, it's unfortunately less clear than we'd all like it to be sometimes. All right, so sometimes, the, especially when you're dealing with smaller companies, they'll want, uh, they'll even ask if we can send them our NDA. And we have, uh, we have links that have our uh, template NDAs. Uh, if they're willing to sign our template NDA um, without edits, beautiful. It's, it's the smoothest transaction possible. You know, you have them sign it, give it to us, process it as UFA, we'll get it unedited and signed by them, we'll sign it, and literally the transaction is, goes super smoothly. When you're dealing with bigger companies, they'll almost never ask for this. They've got their own template agreements, and frankly, that's where they want to start. But ask. Um, yeah. It never hurts, and, or they'll tell you. A yeah. lot of times, they'll just give it to you and say, hey, I think we need to go and get an NDA in place. So it's much easier for the University of Michigan if, if we use our template. Um, often, the, uh, at times, we'll, we'll get a, um, an NDA from a third party, and it requires a lot of negotiation and a lot of time. So if our preference is, is try to use our template. If they absolutely refuse, um, then we'll, um, we'll, we'll attempt to, ne to uh, negotiate the terms and conditions of their NDA. But it's time consuming. Yeah, and, yeah, oh, sorry. Sadie, I have another question. In case we have to sign an NDA, what kind of time frame would be in case we want to keep in mind the first part of the discussion that we want to approach a company they want us to sign an NDA. We send it to your office of research. Is there any time frame before? Like approximate time frame so, so that is needed. Right. Okay, for sure. So the question is, is how long does it take U of M to process these? And the answer is it depends. And the core reason of why it depends is so we get a UFA with an NDA attached to it, to our office, right? We can get to it relatively quickly, but what we can't promise is how long it's gonna sit over at the sponsor. There are companies who are extraordinarily responsive. They'll be on this and they'll get it back to us, it, and it's a really smooth transaction. You'll have other companies, and I have a couple in mind, which I'm not gonna name names, which, you know, they may have, you know, a combination of things. They have overworked legal staff. Um, also, to get into the nuts and bolts, a lot of times the person we're sending the contract to is not an attorney. And so what happens is, is they're not authorized to accept a lot of the changes that we're requesting, especially when we start with their template, which means they kick it back to us, and we can tell right away that they're not authorized, then we have to escalate it to the next level. So all this takes time, if that's required. Again, NDAs don't tend to take that long, but they can, depending on the sponsor. So, you know, basically saying, you know, hey, we got an NDA, and uh, it's got to be signed for a meeting tomorrow. We'll do the best we can. <laughs> but the NDA, yeah, the, N like the NDA does not have to go through a lot of units and department approvals like an actual funded research like a PATH. Okay. So it does not need to. Yeah, it does not require that level of approval. But if it's a uh, time-sensitive request. Um, you should make that known. Let us know. Let us know. And, and what, we, what we can do is in the course of the negotiation, we can let you know if, if we feel it's going to be done in a week, two weeks, or two years. <laughs> okay? We'll have, we'll have a feel for it, how quickly we can get it done. Thank you. <laughs> 
So again, just a link to uh, the template NDAs that we have. Ours are very simple, very to the point, and really all you really need for protection of confidential information. Um, sponsors don't always agree, so that's where some of the fun comes in. So um, how does OTT and ORSP manage requests for NDAs? It's a little different. Um, but I think the, the first point is about what's the underlying purpose, and we discussed this uh, earlier, and the characteristics of the information to be disclosed. So we need, we need that um, to determine whether it's something that ORSP will take, take on or OTT. So in general, if U of M information is going out, or if there's a two-way in which information's going out and coming in, that would be OTT. If the information is coming in, confidential, ORSP, just in general. Yeah, but make sure you're sharing the purpose of the transaction, just in case we're going outside of the zone in which we would actually consider to be an NDA. Because you had mentioned earlier about the approvals. Things that are outside of the standard NDA, the way U of M views it, do require, often require more approvals. And that's part of the reason why it's a different transaction for administrative purposes. So we also um, you know, just read the NDA to ensure it's in compliance with our policies. Um, those are published, I believe, Tony, and state and federal laws. Uh, negotiate acceptable language, and then uh, signs the NDA. So there are um, si there's st signing authority within OTT and ORSP for signing NDAs. Um, outside of those groups, for this purpose, no one else has signing authority. Chairman of departments don't have signing authority. Professors in the departments don't have signing authority. And that's um, per University of Michigan. I have policy. a letter from Tim Slotto that says I can sign unfunded agreements under the purview of my office. It's very specific. <clears throat> I can't sign anything that has money attached to it. So um, if any of you do have that authority, you would know it. You would have some sort of authorization. Which, <laughs> to the point. <laughs> So yeah, and there's actually a standard practice guide on this, as there are most things. So the processes for our two offices are slightly different. Um, uh, ORSP, because almost everything we do goes through um, ERPM. You know, we've got the UFA system in ERPM. You'll want to work with your research admin or your, you know, your departmental research admin. They'll help you get this started and process this. It does not require a lot of approvals, but the better information you can get us, the easier it's gonna be for all. Because a lot of times, I'd say more than half of these that we receive at our office, we have to respond back saying, hey, can you please give me more information on X and Y? And that takes everybody an additional transaction. So, um, but we, of course we wanna get it right, so we'll keep doing that. So better information you can get us, the better off we'll all be. And then Ed can tell you a little bit more about their process. Yeah, the next slide, please. So we don't, uh, OTT does not require uh, the use of um, e-research to submit a request for an NDA. Uh, you can call us, um, call the representative um, for your group, the OTT license specialist. If you don't know who that is, uh, if you go to the web page, it lists the licensing specialist and their areas of responsibility. In the absence of that, you can just call the office and just uh, speak with someone and, and let them know what you're interested in, and uh, they will assign someone uh, to that NDA. They'll get back in touch with you very quickly and start the process. So an email or a phone call will get it, will get it started. And that's both for, that's for confidential information, again, that's going out in a one-way or two-way uh, non-disclosure agreement in which the parties are exchanging information, confidential information. So, uh, and I just spoke briefly today, the two-way NDA is oftentimes gonna be OTT, particularly what you're looking for is whether or not there's a disclosure number. And again, this goes back to, if you think you've got something confidential, call OTT to see if you need a disclosure number. If you don't have a disclosure number, even a two-way will go through ORSP. Um, otherwise, it will go through OTT. So obviously this is outside the scope of this presentation, but it's just a, uh, a prompt to contact your research administrator because that's what they do. They help you put these through the system.
course, we have additional resources, links that um, I believe everyone's going to have a copy of this. Questions? So one thing I will say is um, before, <clears throat> in my experience, and I've been doing this for about 20 years, um, managing contracts and NDAs and research collaborations, not here at the University of Michigan, but in industry, it's really important to know who you're dealing with. And I mean who you're dealing with, there, the, um, the integrity you know, of, the, of the individual or the company, um, their track record for working in, in relationships in which confidential information is the starting point for a discussion. Um, and, and why that's important, because to monitor um, comp the disclosure of um, the breaching confidential uh, disclosures is nearly impossible. You may, you may never find out. You may find out when it's too late. Um, so you can't really depend upon a, a, a legal tr contract uh, in its, on itself to, to protect the confidential information. It's basically a, you know, it's a warning you know, to the parties that if the information is disclosed, there are legal um, ramific potential re legal ramifications for doing it. But short of that, um, it's very difficult. So if you know who you're dealing with, it, it, it goes a long way in making the decision um, when and what to disclose. Under a CDA, you also, NDA, you also don't need to tell everything about your, your project or your confidential information. You can do it in stages. You can give a little bit, decide whether the par parties are interested, and then can continue to uh, disclose the information. And likewise, if you're sitting receiving information, uh, you don't have to take information if you choose not to take it. You could just simply say, that I feel uncomfortable taking the information. The information's out of the scope of the description of, this, of the NDA. So if you're talking about uh, a new braking mechanism for an automobile, and the parties to start discussing braking mechanisms for um, airplanes, uh, it's clearly out of the scope. And um, you don't need to take the information. You'd probably choose not to do it. So there's, um, there are ways of managing the flow of confidential information. And that's, that's really very, very important. Don't depend upon a legal contract to protect the confidential information alone. You have to use common sense and, uh, and good judgment. No, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And um, again, outside the scope of this in general, but something to consider is if you're in these discussions and someone's giving you confidential information which becomes clear to you, and this is not going to be obvious, but sometimes they will actually tell you, when they tell you this is important, that something is export controlled. We can still do the transaction. It's just very important for UMOR, which is now holds the export control compliance uh, arm, to know about this and for our office to know about this. So if that comes up, because we have a lot of what the export control regs consider for nationals, you know? So just, you know, just be on guard for it. So we had, um, we, we just put together a few case studies, you know, just to discuss and, um, you know, maybe we can just work through these and can offer your, your ideas. So the first one is a grant agency informs you that your grant application will not be published, but the reviewers are not required to sign an NDA. So in your, in your grant application, you have a lot of confidential information that's going to go into, could go into a patent application. So is that information protected um, under any confidentiality arrangement, implied or otherwise? Um, would you be able to um, declare that the information wasn't, wasn't a public disclosure and that you could put that in a patent application um, and it can be uh, considered patentable? Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, it is, mm -hmm. but you know, a lot of times I think it's lost, you know, on our faculty and, and, and inventors and researchers. They're, you know, they put an R01 in. Um, they they submit grants to foundations. That is um, that is technically a public disclosure. So, um, what does that mean? Well, let's say f ten years later, um, it's a it's a pharma, it's a comp structure for a pharmaceutical, and um, someone out there in a generic company or someone else is interested in that compound. They could do due diligence and look back and, and maybe find some record of that a, a structure being disclosed prior to the filing of a patent application. So technically, they could, they could move to have that patent invalidated due to a public disclosure. Now, someone is not going to do that for if, the, if, if it's um, 
no, not a commercial product or someone's making $1,000 a year selling this stuff. But if it's a billion dollar drug um, and someone's interested in, in validating a patent, um, they could do that. So it's just, it's just something to consider. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And this is a scenario much more common in sort of if you're dealing with federal grants. Uh, if you're dealing with industry-sponsored research, what is, what is almost always a requirement is that before you publish, you let them review and comment, which means they're looking to see if they think anything's patentable. So usually the patent protection aspect is covered more routinely in the industry-funded agreements. Um, that's not always the case in the, in the federal side because yeah. you just don't have the same considerations. So to be safe, um, before put into grant applications or submit manuscripts, even that manuscript won't appear in print you know, for months, uh, contact OTT and discuss the information that's going to be disclosed. And you know, we could, if it's uh, potentially patentable, we could see a, a patent uh, application could be filed within days just to protect the information. Okay. The other, the another is about a third party wants to copy your provisional patent application, but isn't willing to sign an, an NDA. So, as I mentioned earlier, a provisional patent application um, is um, is a placeholder for a priority date. It gives you a date that you're first to file. The application is not reviewed or examined by the United States PTO. It sits there for a year. That allows the inventor to make improvements or further research to define the invention. But it's not, the application is not published. So during that time, while you have your patentable material, potentially patentable material, um, the priority date established, and you could make a disclosure, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't um, uh, cause any problems with the review of the application. Nevertheless, it's still confidential. So if, if it was to be revealed to someone while that provisional is pending, they could begin working on that idea uh, up until the time that your, your, public, your patent publishes, which everyone could work on to it. In fact, they could work on it until the day that it's, um, it's actually, the claims are actually issued. So you don't want, may not want to give someone a head start uh, in competing in the area uh, by providing a provisional application without a, a non-disclosure agreement. So I'll take this one. Okay. So U of M, an engineering firm, signed a two-way NDA for the parties to discuss a braking system for a subway train. The conversation switches to braking system for an airplane. So the answer is, what did the agreement say? Subway train. Well, did it say subway train? Or did it say, we're going to have discussions for the purpose of looking at future research proposals? So some of these are written very broadly, some of them written very narrowly, and usually that's on purpose, but not always. So sometimes the companies are actually, uh, they want to sort of very specifically specify the nature of the transaction. They don't want it to cover everything, but there are exceptions. There are companies who are interested in maybe multidisciplinary areas, in which case they're gonna have to talk to multiple faculty about multiple things, and so they want a much broader sort of description of purpose. So knowing what the NDA, the scope, the purpose of what it's covering can help you in this situation, knowing whether you should, you know, just keep talking or stop talking. In that case where you would say, okay, maybe you might have something patentable and you're submitting a manuscript and you should just submit it to the office and see if you get a patent, are you protected from the moment you submit that patent? Because your patent might not necessarily go through. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question, the, the, the question is, once the invention disclosure is made and the patent application is filed, is there any protection uh, during that period of time? Is that, is that the question? Well, well un under patent law, there is no protection. There is no protection until the claims are reviewed and allowed by the, the uh, patent jurisdiction. Then that could take uh, up to three years. But what it does do, it, it often discourages others from working in that area. So if it's an area that would require, you know, a lot of money to develop and um, in, a, in, a, in a commercial entity, industrial, uh, if a corporation is looking and seeing that these three or four published pending applications are there, they may not be inclined to work in that area, thinking that those, those claims will be allowed. So it's, um, you can see on some products it has patent pending. So that, that's basically a warning, letting people know, well, it isn't, the patent hasn't issued, we filed patents on it. 
so you better be sure that you want to try to reproduce this article, this device, or whatever, because once the patent issues, we'll defend, we'll defend the claims. But you're not, you're not protected. Um, patents are, you know, serve a few purposes, and uh, you know, one is it gives an individual a monopoly, you know, to practice over a period of 20 years. The the obligation in return is for teaching. So the application, uh, the patent application, and the pat patent application has to be written in a way that someone who's familiar with that area could reproduce and 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 test whether or not those those claims uh, can be reduced to practice. That has to be written in that 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 precisely. And so that's the um, that's the if you will, um, you know, for, in return for the monopoly, um, you have to teach. So during that, so that those applications are pending, people can read them, they can do what they want with them until those claims, and then it's up to you to enforce the claims or not. But it's a good question. I often have faculty think that they're protected because their application is, is submitted. Um, the only thing that's protected is the filing date, that you have a priority over someone. So if someone were to file an application a day later um, on the, exactly the same material, you would have a priority date. Years ago, it was on first to invent. People would go back to lab books and look to see when someone wrote that idea down in, in a lab book, and it could go back years. But no longer those, that's changed. And the last, this, one, this one's interesting. It's under a one-way NDA, you disclose information to a third party on the design of an electronic part for a mobile phone. Three years later, you discover that your design claimed in a UM University of Michigan pending patent application was disclosed in a poster presentation by a former employee of the third party to the NDA. So you sign this contract with uh, a small, small company. Five, six people see the design. Two years later, um, one of the um, scientists, engineers leave, goes to another company. They show up at a meeting, and your design's up on a board. What do you do? So one thing is you need to notify someone to take a look at that NDA and also take a look at the material that was stamped confidential to make sure that the design was stamped and, um, and also um, you know, when, when that information was disclosed um, by the University of Michigan. Um, once that information is disclosed, the individual is free um, to, um, to use that information in the public. So there are exceptions to confidentiality that we won't re um, review now, but one is if it's in the public domain, the uh, obligations are no longer in effect. So it could be that the individual was, um, was free to use that information, or it could mean that they, um, they stole it and they used it for um, their own purpose for the new company. But the challenge is, is once an individual leaves a company and that has signed the NDA, they don't know what, what the individual is doing somewhere else. So it's hard to, for them to monitor and enforce the agreement um, that they signed with you. So it's just something to keep in mind. U of M has that same problem with incoming information because a lot of times sponsors will want us to make sure that our employees are bound even after they leave their employment. And of course, we can't do that. Um, once you leave U of M employment, you're no longer an agent and we're not responsible for you and we can't obligate you necessarily to these, so we just get rid of those provisions typically, so. I think that's it. Yep. <laughs>